darkness, my God, that is who you are. It's good to see some of you. <laughs> Didn't mean to say it that way. <laughs> good to see all of you. <laughs> well, ironically, we're talking about self-control this morning. Have you ever said something that you didn't mean? Have you ever said something that you did mean? <laughs> uh, those of us who have kids, whether you're toddlers or teenagers, can you think of when they're at their worst? Can you think of when toddlers or teenagers are at their worst? Uh, yes, yes, when they haven't had their nap, when they haven't had their snack. Uh, we know now we have this term uh, H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You might even add to that bored, scared, stressed. How do we react? How do we respond when we're at our worst? What comes out as a gut reaction? Those are questions we're going to wrestle with this morning. And try to imagine in your life the, the, the instances of hurt or pain that might have been preserved or protected against if you or someone around you or close to you had more self-control. My sister still remembers things I said 30 years ago in uh, the middle of a road trip when I haven't had uh, anything to eat for hours. She still remembers that. So try to imagine the hurt or harm that we could potentially have avoided or maybe could avoid if we had a little bit more self-control. The Greeks, the Stoics, they put self-control as the premier virtue upon which every other virtue was built. But this morning, we're going to look at what does the Bible say. So with that, would you pray with me? Lord, thank you. Thank you that we could come to church and not just worship and see people, but we could also come to be moved, to be challenged, and to be changed. We believe that when we come here, we are coming here to be confronted by your Spirit, to be comforted, but also confronted. So I pray, Lord, this morning that you would confront us with grace and with truth, and that our hearts would be open to have and to hear what you have to say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're talking about self-control. Can you think of a, a time when you lost it, when you didn't have it? Uh, we all get into those moments, and if you forgot, then ask someone who lives with you. We all have those moments where we lose it, where we just don't have it. Researchers will say that self-control actually has a, a diminishing sense in your life throughout the day. You might start the day with a lot of it, and by the end of the day, every single time you exercise self-control, it doesn't regenerate, it actually depletes. So imagine picking up your teenager at, at school at the end of the day. Imagine picking up a toddler after preschool. And they've been practicing self-control, exercising it all day long. They've been sitting there and being mindful and being patient and, and listening and being in line and, and waiting until the bell rang. Uh, imagine a teenager who has all that extraordinary stress, not only of school, but also who's looking at me, what are they saying about me, where am I going to sit, and all the time wanting to, if they were free, potentially lose self-control and say, hey, doesn't anybody see me? Doesn't anybody like me? Does anybody value me? And that, that's all held up and contained until they get home to you. And then we often wonder, there's not a parent in the world who hasn't said, why are they like that when they get home? We, we all say that almost every day. Why are they like that? Why do we have to put, why do they bring their worst to us? I remember uh, uh, having a, a parent-teacher conference in preschool. It's kind of a joke, but our first child was, uh, we had a parent-teacher conference, and the, and the teacher said, uh, your son is just delightful. And my wife said, really? <laughs> what do you mean? Tell us more. And she said, no, no, no. He's like he's patient, he's kind, he's loving with the other kids. And we're like, wait, wait, which, which kid? And she said, and we still remember this over 10 years later, uh, she said, no, you want, what you want for your children is to be able to contain themselves at school. They, you want them to come home and let it all out so that they can be in the world. And I was sitting there listening, kind of, you know, the dad, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I want that. <laughs> I actually think I wouldn't, pref I wouldn't mind it in reverse. Like, go give their worst to you, and then come home and bring their best to me. I've had a long day, too. But we still remember that. We, we want our kids to be out in the world and handle it well, and then they come back to their safe space, their safe place, the place where they can let it all out. Can you think of a time when you let it all out? I remember it's such a it's still embarrassing moment. I've coached a lot of sports, and one of the 
early days of me coaching, particularly my son's sport, baseball, which was my sport, baseball, and they were little. I mean, little, little. I look at that age now and think, what a, what a silly joke it is to even coach that age of sports or even try to organize boys at six and seven years old. It's a joke. But I remember being there and taking it extremely seriously as though it was the Olympic Games. Like, it was so serious. The amount of time me and these two assistant coaches would text each other throughout the week planning the lineup for six and seven-year-old boys was absurd. And I was very diligent. I'd always wanted to be a coach, and this is my sport, and this is my son. And one of the hallmark phrases that I built early on was, get your gloves dirty. Boys, get your gloves dirty. Every time the pitch, or that case, it was the pitching machine, you got to get your gloves down and get them dirty. This is the end of the season, and we've been playing, you know, way too many games for that age, uh, 18, 19, 20 games. And I was in the outfield. At that age, the coaches were in the field. It was that young. And I was out in the outfield, right field, uh, next to where all the parents were. And I was actually holding my baby daughter at that point. And I was kind of holding her in the field and coaching and telling the boys what to do. And my son was at second base, my position. And I'm reminding him every single pitch, boys, glove dirty, glove dirty. And there was one kid on the team that seemed to, whenever the coach, me, would say something, give direction, there's one boy that seemed to do kind of the opposite. Can you imagine who that was? Of course, it's always the coach's son. You could always see the coach's son. Well, I handed my little baby daughter back to my wife, and all the moms are sitting there, and I'm kind of interacting. I look over, and there's a pitch coming. I say, gloves dirty. Like, now it's, you know, marching orders. And here is a short, small, slow ground ball to second base. And I'm behind my son, 15, 20 feet, Son, just make sure, glove, dirty, glove, down, come on. And sure enough, last second, he stands up and the ball goes right between his legs. Have you ever had a moment where you lost it in public? <laughs> I won't recreate the whole scene, but I, no joke, fell to my knees in the outfield, put my arms out and cried to the heavens, the top of my lungs, kale, shimmel, screamed it. And I then sort of came to my senses, like I'm outside with people. And I look over, and there's a, the lineup of moms just staring, mouths open, at me. And I put my hands on my forehead, and I said, I need to take a walk. And my wife said, you'd better. <laughs> Have you ever had a, a moment where you just lost it? And, and there's a phrase I think some of us have used, I, I just couldn't help myself. And that's one of the most honest, vulnerable, accurate phrases we can say. I just couldn't help myself. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't control it. It's the opposite of self-control. I remember uh, I was kind of a young Casanova. I had girlfriends like kindergarten, first grade, all throughout elementary school. In sixth grade, I had this long-term girlfriend. I think it was like four months. And remember at that age, it, you know, what does it even mean to have a boyfriend, girlfriend? We'd say hi to each other uh, at recess or something. But there was this end-of-the-year sixth-grade dance. And she wasn't there. Don't remember why, or she was out of town or something. And, but it was a sixth grade dance. It was our first dance. And, uh, and there was this moment where there was a slow song. And it just kind of go back in your mind what that was like and, and, and that memory. And, and there I am, and my girlfriend's not there. I don't know where Kelly is, but I didn't really know her anyway. So I look over, and there's this sweet girl I've known for years. Her name's Nicole, and she had just broken her arm. She had a cast on, and she was kind of sitting off to the side when everyone else was dancing. She happened to be cute. That was <laughs> something else I noticed. And I walked over and I said, uh, would you like to dance with me? I said, sure. So we're dancing and, and all, like all the moms were there. My mom's the PTA president, so I could see her. I could kind of hear like, oh, that's so cute. And how sweet of him to dance with a girl with a broken arm. And, and then another you know, fast dance and then another slow song. So I was like, wow, that's kind of, I don't know, something happens. Kind of felt something. And so I went back to Nicole and said, would you like to dance again? And she's like, sure. So there we are dancing, however that meant at that age, <laughs> with a broken arm. And, and I said, All right, do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> and then she said, I thought you had a girlfriend. I said, oh, <laughs> you're right. So I dropped the conversation. I went and I found Kelly's best friend. And I said, hey, would you let Kelly know <laughs> we're no, no longer boyfriend, girlfriend? And uh Strange, uh, okay. A third slow dance. Hey, Nicole, <laughs> would you like to dance? She said, sure. I said, hey, I don't have a girlfriend anymore. 
I found out a few days later that was not cool. <laughs> but here's my defense. The heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> I, I just couldn't help myself. Uh, when we get to the end of ourselves, when we want something, it's not, always, it's not always when we get to those moments where we feel bored or hungry or angry or lonely or tired or scared or stressed. Sometimes we just want something. And typically what we want is not what we want. I wanted to dance with a girl. What I really wanted, I wanted to feel connected. I wanted my son to get his gloves dirty. I, didn't, yeah, I, wanted, I wanted to win the game, but I wanted to be the kind of dad that had a victorious team. I wanted to have a Disney movie made after me. There's a deeper desire there, and something gets fractured. Something gets ruined. Something, there's a glitch, and it irritates us, and we respond. We react. We explode. Paul talks about that uh, in a very famous passage, whether you've been a part of the church and read the Bible or not, there's this battle that he talks about between flesh and spirit. And he almost stumbles over this idea, I just can't help myself. I want to do these things, and I want to be this kind of person, but I can't help myself. Something else comes out. I'm trying, and it just, something else gets in the way. There's this flesh that he calls it. And then the spirit, the spirit part of me, the love side of me, the God part of me, desires something, and then the flesh gets in the way, and I just, I can't help myself. We can all relate to that. Uh, in Proverbs, there's this verse that says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken through. In ancient time, a city without a wall was defenseless. It was vulnerable. Vulnerable to attack. It couldn't protect itself. But it meant even more than that. A city without a wall meant it didn't have a real identity. It wasn't a real city yet. If it was broken, it had been fractured. In other words, who are we if we don't have this wall? And there was always a greater sense, the, the spiritual questions that would come up. Uh, why would this happen to us? Where, where is God? Why wouldn't he protect us? Because this wall is a symbol of God surrounding us. And that means we have an identity. We, we are this from this place. Have you ever met somebody who's really proud of their place that they're from? That's, if you don't have a place that you're proud of, who am I? And you get disoriented. And if you're defenseless, you don't know who you are, and we don't know who we are, people are going to start leaving. All of a sudden, you don't feel like there's anyone here with me. We don't really belong anywhere or to anyone. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Something happens to us when we don't feel safe. Something happens to us when we feel lost or alone or rejected. Something happens to us. And Paul, specifically in the New Testament, talks a lot about cultivating this virtue of self-control. But the question is, how do we do that? There's a fascinating research that comes out of neuroscience that talks about this, what happens to us when we're stressed. And there's these things called stressors, things that happen to us, and then we respond with stress, there's this feeling, and it's a, actually a physiological body response. We feel, and the, I love the phrase I read in this one book, I read research papers, uh, when we have this perceived sense of danger. And that's a pretty broad definition because what feels dangerous to me is different than it is to you. Somebody, friends of mine who are Navy SEALs, have a different sense of perceived danger and threat. They have a different physiological response. But I also know Navy SEALs who get very, uh, one guy said, the, the, I would rather be in combat being shot at than go to a job interview. It's a, your perceived sense of danger that causes stress. Uh, we feel danger when we feel these same things that it talks about the ancient walls, when we don't feel safe, when we feel lost, when we feel alone, when we feel like people don't like us. That's stress that comes up. And from a neuroscience standpoint, the, the good parts of our brains, the good parts of our rational thoughts and thinking through our values and thinking what's about what's most lovable and kind and, and, and good, that actually gets shut off. Our brain is literally kind of shut off from accessing those good things and we go to the path of least resistance, which might be lashing out. It might be saying something you don't mean. And so how do we ever cultivate a pattern, a lifestyle where people would say, man, that guy's, I don't know, full of love and kindness and goodness. And gentleness, how do we cultivate that path? That's the big question. Greeks and the Stoics said self-control is number one, but Paul's answer was that love was number one. He said that in Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love 
and joy. Many of you have memorized this verse. You kind of forget one of these love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Some of you are, uh, remember Bob Newhart. He had this famous sketch where he was acting as a therapist, and this patient comes in with this uh, uh, not just psychological problem, but problem in her family, and she's explaining what happens, and I keep doing this thing, and I can't help it, and it's really, you, just, you hear the echoes of Paul talking about, I wanted to do what I want to do, but I can't help it, and I do what I don't want to do, and she's describing this problem, and, and the therapist, Bob Newhart, is kind of sitting there, yeah, 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 and, then at, and, sh- and he's, he's kind of says, are you done? And she's like, well, yeah, that, that's the issue. He said, oh, okay, do you want to know how to solve that? And she's, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. So, well, uh, I'm going to tell you how to solve it. She said, okay. And she starts bringing out notes. He's like, you don't need to take notes. <laughs> it's pretty simple. And she's like, okay. He said, easy. If you want to stop that problem, just stop it. Stop doing it. Stop it. And, that's, and the, the, the underlying joke is, how do we just stop it? That's the collective version we all have of self-control. Just, just stop it. And that's, I think, what many of us think of self-control. It's this idea that we're going to master our own wills. We're just going to stop doing these things. That's really where this idea of morality comes in. We're just going to stop doing the wrong things and start doing the right things. You might hear echoes in that of like, oh, it seems like Jesus didn't like that whole notion. As he attacked people through his life, the Pharisees, who had that same idea. You could just master your will. It's all about managing the externals. It's all about managing your behavior. Or Dallas Willard, my favorite author, say, it's all about managing your sin. Just getting a little bit more effective at managing your sin, particularly the ones that other people will notice. That's what the good life is. And Jesus would say, no, 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 that's not the good life. That is not, actually, that life leads you to more destruction. That life leads you to more isolation, more rejection, more big questions like who am I and who belongs to me and who I, who I belong to and who loves me. Because nobody knows the real you. The Bible, the passage, the, the, the rhythm, the path that God has for us is to respond to the love that first comes towards us. To respond to the love that first comes towards us. How do we do that? Jesus, in the beginning part of the story that is told about him, gets baptized in the River Jordan, and then instantly it says he's taken to the desert to be tempted by the devil himself for 40 days, no food, out in the desert. And we read the story of how the devil comes to tempt Jesus at his worst, when he's hungry, (laughs) lonely, tired. I don't know if he's angry or not, but maybe. I wouldn't be surprised. Is this this the start of my ministry? what What do you mean, sending me out here? I was going to do great things. What he and he's tempted. And these series of temptations, the first one is the devil saying, hey, here's a stone. You must be hungry. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? Do something. Resolve this problem. Uh, do something that would be relevant to, to solve your own, sol- your, your own issue right now. Do something. And Jesus says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. The second one is really this idea that the devil comes and says, hey, uh, why don't you uh, put yourself up on the, the temple and then jump off and, and then save yourself by your angels and in front of all the people, do something that's just so spectacular that everyone would say, oh my gosh, who is this person? And when Jesus was at his worst, at his loneliest, at his uh, uh, most vulnerable, he says, I'm not going to do that either. And then the devil says, how about the whole, uh, everything? Why don't you just have it all? And all the kingdoms of the world will belong to you and we'll rule together. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that either. And there's something in that, the way Jesus responds, that ought to make us at least wonder, what was it inside of him that enabled him at his worst to master that self-control? What was it? Was it his, no, I'm not going to, was it mastery over his will? Was it just, I don't, no, people are watching, people are going to tell this story, I can't. Was there something flowing out from within him? I wonder if self-control is less about something that we just bolster ourselves to and more about something we respond to. As Paul says, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit. It's not the, what we do to it. It's the fruit of it. It comes out of us. And the key to Jesus, the key to our lives, is at the start of that temptation story, is God the Father telling Jesus himself, 
You are my beloved son. You belong to me. This is your identity. With you, I am well pleased. And I believe that what Jesus was doing in that desert was reflecting on that, meditating on that, cultivating that sense of it being real inside of him so that when he responded to that temptation, when he was at his worst, what flowed out of him was goodness and gentleness and patience and self-control. Self-control is not about mastering our will. It's about surrender to the reality of who God is and what he's doing and saying to us in this very moment. So what does it look like? I just cannot escape that in the Christian life, the path to growth seems to be a reflection on what's actually going on inside of us. It's taking more time to meditate and to get honest with things like asking myself questions as I write in a journal, as talking to a friend that I trust and them asking me the same, what's going on inside you? How are you doing? In what ways are you feeling lonely? Where are you seeing and experiencing anger? When are you feeling stressed? What does that look like? And actually paying attention to that and somehow opening the door to that is the door to allowing God to speak into that again and hear those words. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I just can't escape it. I wish it was a little bit easier. I wish it was just a set of rules. I wish it was the uh, uh, Jocko Willink, who is this former Navy SEAL that's now a huge podcast star and writer and discipline is freedom. Try harder, grind harder, rise and grind. I wish that was the path. It'd actually be a lot easier. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And it seems like the path is always, no, 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 that's not it. It's not mastering this, it's surrendering to it. And every single time that loneliness I feel, that vulnerability that I feel, is not a sign or a symbol to try harder. It's a signal to step away and open up my heart again and ask God what he says about me and who I am. That I am lonely, I am vulnerable, and he sees me in that space and wants to meet me there. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you that you come to us, and at every stage and season, as we choose to listen to you, that the flow of your love is towards me, it's towards us. And when we're not living in that reality, God, Help us to see that it's not because that reality has changed or it's not true. It's just that we haven't listened. We haven't stopped. And so I pray, God, that you would teach all of us how to let go more, how to surrender more, how to stop and listen. That we wouldn't put our hand to the plow when we feel stressed or anxious. We would put our hand to our pen and to the Bible and to a a phone to call a friend to turn towards silence and solitude when we feel like we need to try harder. And help us to hear your voice, God, that still small voice that is always whispering to us about who we are, our identity and our belonging and our purpose in you. Help us to experience that as a real, as a real reality. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And may God the Father bless you with wisdom. May God the Son teach you about how much you're loved. May God the Spirit help you be loving and patient and kind and filled with self-control. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.